This is the Auto Body Podcast, presented by Clarity Co. Hey everyone, welcome back to the podcast. And today we've got a pretty interesting guest, and I guarantee you, it's not going to be like any of the other ones that we've had, which is, uh, which is, which is nice. We've got to mix it up every once in a while. So we have Chris Mamone on today's uh, episode, and the reason why Chris is special is because Chris has actually encountered just just a little bit of adversity in his time, and has somehow overcome all of it to be a productive, um, pr- productive and inspiring human being. So. Chris, would you mind just kind of introducing yourself, uh, telling people where you're at and what you're doing right now? Just tell us who Chris is. <laughs> My name is uh, Chris Mimoni. I've uh, been in the auto collision industry since 2011. Uh, you know, like he mentioned that, you know, I've dealt with a lot of medical adversity. Um, in short, I was uh, born three months early uh, weighed two and a half pounds, had 14 brain surgeries before I was five years old, uh, overcame that. Uh, then I uh, started working for my parents in 2010. I graduated with a bachelor's in business uh, from California Lutheran University, and I uh, worked uh, as a production manager at our biggest location in San Gabriel, California. Uh, our Monthly sales goal was 625,000 a month, uh, 90 cars in process uh, daily. Uh, our CSI was between 98 and 100%. And I worked a lot with making, you know, with all processes of, of the shop. In 2014, we sold the Service King Collision Centers. Um, and I w- was the first to be on their quality assurance team in Southern California. I oversaw 22 locations uh, before another teammate came aboard. I was known nationally for my quality uh, teachings that I tried to preach in the SoCal market and the classes I would host, uh, national calls, and just the education I tried to bestow to make my market and uh, much better because when you're, you're acquiring locations, uh, you know, you have teammates that think differently because they come from different cultures. So I really tried to preach a certain culture that I came from and I was able to get teammates to change their mindset uh, in certain ways to make them that much better. And uh, after that in 2018 i had a lot of medical uh things pop up i had in short had five spine surgeries and seven brain surgeries between 2019 and 2020 and uh lost uh a handful of different things neurologically uh they said i was going to be paralyzed three times and uh i walk with a with a walker but it hasn't stopped me from, you know, moving forward and making um, the industry better. Um, after 2020, I was invited uh, to speak as a motivational speaker at Verifax. And there I met um, the uh, HR director for Car Star Collision Centers in La Cunada, California. I did consulting for their three locations and uh, preached a lot of the processes I learned from Marco's Auto Body and learned from my dad, Marco Mimoni. And then after that, uh, Fender Bender Magazine uh, featured me in their February uh, mag- uh, edition in this last February. Hmm. And then after that, I've, I'm currently doing a podcast with them. I've done six so far. And what I've been told and I'm proud to say is that I'm the most downloaded uh, presenter they've had in their history of doing podcasts with their magazine. And a lot of the topics that I pick uh, are topics about quality process, uh, how to make the shot better internally. And I 
and how to make your customer experience better, how to gain customer retention. Those are different things that um, I definitely try to do. Wow. Okay. So it seems like you've had a, a little bit more difficult life, at least in the beginning that, you know, most people have probably experienced. So what kind of comes to mind, Chris, if you don't mind me asking is you've gone through these really hard times and, and really hard surgeries. And, you know, we're kind of in a time where people are experiencing lots of hard times all across the board. And I'm curious, what is it that you were thinking about holding on to, you know, whatever it might be to get you through those hard times. Um, and so that people could possibly, um, learn from that or take away from it and you could help someone, um, listening. Yeah. Um, what I, what got me through it, I always would look at, I don't have it worse than most people. So whatever I'm going through, I know that someone may have it worse than I do. And so that got me through it in the sense where I just had to keep, you know, confident and positive and what, what was going to be happening to me, uh, positive or negative. Uh, religion was a big part of the uh, factor for me, uh, you know, keeping the faith that, you know, I'm going to be okay, uh, no matter if it turned to be paralyzed or not. Um, you know, the first surgery went great, and then everything started to snowball at that point. So, you know, religion was a big part of it, um, and also family. Uh, you know, the during COVID was my fourth surgery. And that was one of the ones that they said, you know, be prepared to wake, wake up paralyzed. Mm -hmm. And that surgery was the one that my spine took the biggest hit and um, caused a lot of different issues. And but I was by myself. So when I woke up, you know, I meant just imagine if I was paralyzed, what that would feel like. Luckily, I was able to move my feet. Um, but being by myself, definitely had to take a lot of courage and, and you know, strong will to get through that uh, before they put me to sleep. So, but everything went well. Um, I haven't had a spine surgery in two years. Uh, so I think I'm in the clear and I don't, I don't, I don't look back and you know, I've, that's what I've done after that. And two years have happened, nothing's gone on. I've done, like I said, all the different accomplishments uh, with Fender Bender and Car Star and uh, being invited to this podcast. So, you know, it's uh, just move forward from here and enjoy the ride. Well, I can't say that the podcast is on the same level as speaking on a stage in front of your peers or anything like that, but it's close. It's close. Uh, <laughs> um, I've had the privilege of talking with some very high up, like military people and um, people that have gone through just hard training, uh, military training. And something that's really interesting is that when you, when you have the same kind of discussions with them, and you ask them like, how did you, how did you get through that? Like, I mean, you're talking about something that literal, like the whole goal of the training is to weed out 90% of people and the top 10% are what's left. And they, one of the things that almost across the board, everyone says is you learn that you just, it's just one day at a time, one step at a time. The only thing I was thinking about when, you know, it was hell week or whatever is that all I care about is that I get to the next goal or I um, walk another 50 feet or whatever it might be. Now, I'm just curious, is this something that when, you know, you were going through your hard times, is that kind of like the same mentality that you had that you were just like, you know what? Okay, all I got to do is I just got to wake up from surgery and then, okay, I've woken up. Now I just need to, you know, last the next couple of hours or concentrate in the next couple of hours or whatever. Is that, did you have a similar kind of mindset? Uh in a given way, my, my mindset was I wanted to prove the doctors wrong. 
even though they said neurologically, they always told me the first year you'll gain, your spine might gain the most progress of healing. Uh, after that year, you know, things will start to diminish. And then after the second year, pretty much whatever you're left with, you're left with. Uh, out of the all five spine surgeries, I had no positive gains whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, having that experience at the beginning and then seeing after every spine surgery and coming to the realization that nothing was going to possibly happen uh, didn't stop me from, you know, pushing forward, walking, doing this kind of, you know, different thing where I was trying to push my, my body as much as I could. And when he mentioned the military examples, uh, when we get into the work atmosphere, I'll start mentioning a particular individual that I worked under, he who was an ex Navy SEAL. So, um, you know, I'll speak about that shortly. But yeah. I will say that, you know, one second at a time, one minute at a time, you know, if you, that's the best way that I went about it. And whatever struggle someone is dealing with, I would have the same mindset. Don't look 10 feet ahead of you. Just concentrate on that one foot and then push yourself another three feet. And then, you know, if don't look back uh, because you'll, you know, it's, you just have a negative mindset. Um, but remember, you're going to fall a lot, but when you get up, keep going, but y you will start maybe noticing those trends. Oh, I'm thinking negative again. Mm -hmm. That's where you learn. Every time you fall, you get up, but you're learning. Okay. I, I fell because of this reason. So you start noticing that same trend and then you, you kind of train yourself. Don't think that way. Don't act that way, you know, and, and, and you'll slowly start changing your mindset to, to weed out that and it, you'll just get better and better. Uh, and for those of you guys that are listening to the podcast, and not watching it, which, um, you know, we haven't done, been doing a great job of uploading the YouTube videos uh, or the videos of the podcast, but we're, going to be um, for sure uploading all the well most I should say most of the previous podcasts and this episode will go on YouTube as well um, you'll notice or again if you're listening you won't get this but Chris is kind of a younger guy uh, Chris do you mind if I ask how old you are 39 39 yeah so I mean a lot of adversity for somebody that's um, that's your age um, so what is a I guess kind of go into who this military guy was because I'm interested um, as to and what did you what about what time are we talking about that you came under this guy's wing and like what did you learn from them? So uh, when we sold the Service King uh, in 2014, I was in the Southern California market because I'm located in near in Los Angeles, California, mm -hmm. and the Vice President of Operations, uh, his name is Alan Saviano. He's now the COO of Crash Champions, but he is uh, an ex-Navy SEAL, and he was on SEAL Team Two. Mm. He, uh, you know, he taught me a lot. Um, I've always had good work ethic, um, a lot of good qualities about myself. But I remember it was the first day we became part of Service King, and I uh, showed. He said. You know, everyone show up at eight o'clock for a meeting at, at corporate. So I show up on time, like I always do. He looked at me and he said, you're late. And I politely asked him, what do you mean? He said, in the SEALs, if the mission starts at eight and you show up at eight, the boat already left. So you have to show up 10 minutes early. I usually always do, but I happen to show up at eight o'clock, but that was, a, I, I took it like, okay, I, I know his expectation. Uh, you know, he was very big about a lot of different things. Um, he had me watch a commencement speech uh, done by General McRaven. 
It, it was uh, at Texas, Texas A&M, which I encourage any, anyone to listen to, just type in a VCO commencement speech. It is the most impactful speech I've ever listened to. Um, also, he had us read a book called Extreme Ownership, How Navy Seals Win and Lead. That book is life-changing if you want to. Um, it can be done, this, this book can be related to business, personal life. Uh, it gives, every chapter gives a, a, a Navy SEAL example and then it integrates into a business example. Uh, yeah. I won't go in depth on the type of example unless you want me to, but it, it definitely is. Those are two impactful things that he had us read, uh, read and listen to. And I learned a lot from him. And uh, I also changed uh, a lot of his mindset um, because wow. of the qualities that I had and that I brought to the table. And so it it was a really great relationship and he's actually going to be, I'm going to be speaking at SEMA this uh, November in Las Vegas and uh, he actually will be attending. So it's going to be really, really cool. And part of my speech is with General McRaven in that commencement speech. So it, working under Alan Saviano was definitely a game changer for me. Uh, on a personal level and uh, also on a business level. So I was really fortunate to learn under him. The reason why I smiled and chuckled at Extreme Ownership is because that is a book that um, I always recommend to everyone. Um, in fact, it's the only book that I'm aware of that I will buy for someone, whether it be audiobook, whether it be a hard copy, uh, if I if I have the confidence that they will read it or listen to it, I will buy it for them and say, this is my gift to you. I want you to read it, listen to it, because I believe in this that much. Um, and I mean, I'm guessing then you've read the follow up books, um, Dichotomy of Leadership. Um, and he has a Jocko has a couple of other books out as well. But they're, you know, they, they all do with leadership. You know, if you, I guess, go down that mantra or a rabbit hole that he has. But um that's that i mean i the interesting thing about that is is i don't even need to meet alan and i already know what kind of guy he is you know what i mean and that's a guy that i can get behind um just quickly if you could um summarize it like uh, and we've actually talked about that book previously on the podcast we haven't gone real in depth on it and it would actually be interesting to just kind of do a Jocko style podcast where he takes a book and like breaks it down and, you know, highlights sections and then talks about those. It'd be interesting to go through that with someone who's actually also read it and then do a podcast on it. But anyways, when you were reading that book, what was some of the things that really popped out at you and were the most impactful for you? There were, uh, two different, I, I believe chapters, um, check your ego was the biggest, um, if, if anyone is going to even touch that book and they don't even want to read, I hate reading, hate it with a passion, but if you're going to read any chapter or look it up online, read that one, because mm -hmm. they say ego clouds the mind, it clouds your judgment. And it states, and I was always told as well, everyone can always find fault in what you do. And the same thing with that commencement speech, they say uniform inspection. You know, the, you were not, they, he states that the, the people in charge were always gonna find something wrong with your uniform. They never worked, you were never gonna have a perfect uniform and a lot of people, a lot of students would drop out because they didn't understand the purpose of the drill. And so with Check Your Ego, you always have to go into the mindset that um, if you're going to start, let's say, complaining to a manager about a coworker, the manager is going to look at you and say, you know, Chris, you show up on time. Well, sometimes do you clean your, your work stall before you leave? Yeah. Uh, do you, um, you know, do you do certain things? And if the answer is no or maybe, that's where they, you got to remember one finger is pointing at the situation and two are pointing right back at you. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So check your ego uh, is a big equalizer for a lot of people, including myself, even today. Um, no bad teams, only bad leaders uh, was a big one as well. Um, those two chapters stand out uh, the most to me. Um, you know, it, granted, there can be bad teams, but it, it starts from above. You know, and that's what I say to my podcasts is that everything starts with leadership and it feeds all the way down to whatever qualities the management uh, from corporate bleeds down to management and then it bleeds down to the employees. If your quality, if the expectation from corporate quality is not important, management's not gonna think it's important, then it's gonna feed off on your employees, then you're gonna bring out a bad product, the customer retention's not gonna be there, and you're gonna wonder why work is going to other body shops or going to uh, other uh, firms, uh, whatever it may be. So uh, that's where, um, those two chapters for me were extremely impactful. I actually have not read the other books um, mm. that you had mentioned, um, but you know, I I've listened to the commencement speech probably twenty five times, um, and if you're gonna do either or, ladies and gentlemen, I would recommend you listen to the speech versus the book. Um, because every single example he gives is you can put to real life. And it's, it's a quick 16 minutes, but it'll change, change your thinking no matter what your personal or work. I don't know why I thought of this as you were speaking, but for some reason, this, this personal story of mine popped into my head when it was talking about expectations start from the top and kind of bleed their way down there was a point in time uh when i was a diesel mechanic that i was working for a shop and the the place was just run like a mess it just nothing was in order and they decided that they were going to hire an outside consultant to come in and you know organize and improve things optimize efficient you know, gain efficiencies and everything like that every one of us as workers was jazzed about this right we were super happy we were all on board with it and one of the first things that this um third party consultant decided to do was to grab each one of us and have a little sit down with us and ask us what we thought could be improved and uh i took it upon myself to sit down one night and get a list of things together and things that I thought were shortcomings of the shop and what we could do better and blah, 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 right? Well, day of my little sit down meeting comes and we're having an exchange back and forth. And she says, okay, so, you know, give me your opinion of what you think could be better about the shop. And I pull out this list. She immediately starts laughing and she goes, you have an entire list. And I was like, yeah and she goes and she just laughs and she's like oh my gosh okay well i didn't know it was that serious and i was like okay well okay if that's the attitude then i immediately i went from really giving a shit to going to the level of i'm gonna fuck this thing up like if you guys think this is gonna go well i'm gonna do everything in my power to just to just not make this go well and it just it was amazing because then i passed that on to all the other workers right and every everyone across the board, the whole they spent thousands of dollars for no reason. And when the time came, owner of the company comes down, which we actually had a really good relationship with the owner of the company. And he asked, you know, he's like, hey, you know, it doesn't seem like you guys are on board with this, blah, blah, blah. And I said, yeah, you want to know why? Told him the story. Instantly, he was fuming. Like, he was, he was like, that is embarrassing. He's like, what? anyways, I don't want to go too far into it, but... It's it's amazing how I mean was the list maybe a, going a bit far sure but I kind of wanted to get my ideas in order and I wanted to be professional about it right and um, it was uh, it, it then just appeared to me that okay well, this is just all for show then we're not actually here to fix anything it's just we're just here for show anyways um 
I don't want to hang around that for too long, but the the general idea behind that is is that what you're saying, um, if I would have had the teachings of Jocko and what he talks about beforehand, I would have realized that actually it is up to me to improve the quality of things. It, it's on me to improve my leadership and to um, lead the shop better. And I, I learned a lot, of, but I was young. I was like, I mean, we're talking like, I was like 22, right? Like all a 22 year old knows is testosterone and ego. That's it. <laughs> um, but let's, uh, if you don't mind, um, let's talk about your time with Service King. Um, so it, it was, were you working in your dad's shop at that time when Service King comes in and buys it? Um, what was kind of like that transition like for you? Uh, the transition actually was pretty easy for myself. Um, you know, once we sold, they, you know, asked me to be on the team. And um, it, it was, you know, I was uncomfortable at the beginning because I didn't know, you know, what, how to go about explaining to people, you know, that the product that they're, they're giving isn't good enough or to my expectation explaining because, you know, I'm young explaining to a person that's probably 15 years older than me and how to present myself uh, present myself in a, in a diplomatic and professional manner and i made you know i learned a lot of different techniques on how to communicate with people and um you know by the end of it you know i had technicians uh, especially technicians older younger they said you know chris i didn't want to listen to you in the beginning i i want no part of it you know but as i started seeing i had less comebacks i would have a uh get a car done because i spent the extra 15 minutes or 10 minutes or five minutes making sure the product was that much better before it left to go to the next department i started noticing i i wasn't having problems i had you know I would get new jobs, new assignments my way. And I just did the car once right the first time. And, you know, I I bought in to what you were saying. And, and same with advisors, um, you know, it got at the end of my time with Service King, they said to me, you oh, Chris, we've never had someone who is a man of their word when they say they'll do something. And I spent time training people and making them better. Uh, I used to calibrate Teslas when Tesla, you know, first started coming out. And I really, I actually was recruited to work for them. And uh, because how in depth I tried to learn about the car at that time, and then I would train um instead of yeah yes i would do the calibrations for the shops like i would always do but i would i would grab the technician i'd grab the advisor or general manager and i'd make them sit down and learn it you know and it just made them that much more prepared that much more educated on the car and uh, that way you know they can have some appreciation and respect for the vehicle because it is a complicated car uh, like any kind of, if you don't, have, if you don't have the education, it, it's um, a lot of things can possibly happen that can snowball. And so, um, at the end of my career with Service King, um, I was real proud of the accomplishments that I had with them. And uh, you know, I was promoted to Quality Assurance Team Lead in 2016. I was on the PAC board at UTI Technical Institute in Long Beach. Uh, I was a keynote speaker uh, that year, and uh, a lot of you know, I did you know national calls about construction material, um, you know what not to do, what to do when, when repairing a car, uh, different kind of classes. Um, you know, I, I I didn't care if it was auto collision related, professional related. Um, I was always there to help people. I didn't have to be just about body shop um, and I was also a person that would just listen and uh, if they wanted advice I gave it to them if not I was a good sounding board for them and, and they really 
enjoyed that kind of uh, individual and in meeting. So that that was a big thing and something I'm proud of with Service King. This is actually something that we've talked about quite a bit on the podcast, which is the older generation teaching the younger generation, because that is something that right now the industry needs really badly. What is it that you were doing as a younger guy teaching the older guys? What's some techniques that some of these younger guys that might be listening could use to approach the older guys in the shop and get some advice or learn from them? Um, you know, and conversely, you know, if they're willing to listen to it, the older guys that are listening, what can they do to uh, understand the younger the younger generation and and help them out so that we can you know we're not struggling in 10 years as an industry um well one thing technology is always changing and that's something that the younger generation obviously is very savvy with versus uh even myself i mean my younger cousins know more about certain things about certain apps or or what have you that i had no idea what's going on so you know me being older if you're a technician or you're a corporate manager uh, you know i don't want this strictly to be auto collision based but you know be willing to ask questions that you always you don't know what you don't know and so the first step, check your ego. Check your ego. <laughs> Seriously, because you don't know everything. Even though you might be a VP um, of a law firm or a manager, you're always going to learn something from someone. So, you know, by the end of this podcast, you might learn one thing. Maybe it was the beginning with the Navy SEAL stuff. And the rest of the thing, rest of the information that we're going to talk about was good, but you got that out of it. And I always was told um, if you take one thing from a speech or a conference call, it was worth it. So, you know, that I would say if you're an older uh, individual, you know, ask questions to, you know, may maybe ask them. You know, if you're teaching students, you know, how do you like to learn? You know, because a lot of people, um, it, it's the same thing with that, that book I was telling you about, um, with ex, um, extreme ownership. Uh, right. It gives examples how uh, a manager will give an, uh, tell his, uh, a person that he's working with one thing one time and they don't understand it. So he goes to the manager, his supervisor saying, well, this person's not gonna cut it. And then the supervisor says, well, how many times did he explain it? Well, I only explained it once, he should understand it. How many different times did you explain it? Well, I only explained it one different way, he should be able to understand it. And so in the military and also in business, people like myself may need three or four times and, and on that kind of way. You'll need at least a couple times to understand the concept or you're gonna to need to have it heard a different way. So, yep. you know, that is one thing I would say with older, uh, more seasonal individuals. Uh, ask the people that you uh, have under you, you know, how, do you, how, how would you like me to explain this to you? Yeah. I've. I've said this on the podcast before, um, and I, I wish I wasn't this way, but in order for me to understand something or to be bought in to doing something, I have to know the why. I, I need to know I need to know the full context of if I don't do this, here's the chain of events that happen. And if I do do it, here's the chain of events that happen. Here's the reason why we're doing this. And then this is where I come in. Now, what was interesting to me was that the older people or the older ge gentlemen that I would work with would almost get offended by this. And I would, 
I would ask, you know, I wasn't, uh, and you know, maybe part of it, actually probably most of it was the way that I was presenting the why, you know, I would just look at them and say, well, why are we doing that way? Right. It, it, it could have been delivered in a better way. Um, now that I'm older and, you know, I have a little less ego then you know, now I know how to ask the question better. But when it was always interesting to me that that's the way that I, if I, if I don't understand where I fit in this whole cog in the wheel, I just don't give a shit about the cog in the wheel. I don't give it, I don't care about the cog like at all. And I don't need to know details of like what every single person is doing, but I need to understand if you don't do this, this whole thing gets thrown off and here's why. And man, I tell you what, like that really caused a lot of problems for a lot of people that I talked with when I needed to know the why behind we were doing it because what I would get told is don't worry about it. Just do your job, get over to your corner and do it. Okay. Well now I'm really not bought in. Right. Like, and that's actually the reason uh, that's actually something that Jocko talks about in his book. Um, it might not be extreme ownership, but it's for sure in dichotomy, which is that if your people don't understand the mission and don't understand their part in the mission and they're not bought in, then they're just not going to be, they're not going to be that effective they're they're not going to do what you want them to do and what's interesting about that is so you might there might be someone older listening to this podcast and we we have this character on the show called jimmy and jimmy's a curmudgeon old dude right who's been in the body shop world for 40 plus years and um he's a cantankerous old dude and and he's probably listening right now and saying, well yeah damn right like the kids just need to do what they're told don't need to know I want you to understand something. We're talking about the most elite fighting force on the place, on the face of this planet. And the guy was leading hundreds of them and saying, and he wrote a book saying that if these guys don't understand why they're doing something, they will not be as effective. We're talking about elite warriors. So I think it's fair to say that it's probably a good idea to make sure that everyone understands their role and understands why it's important. You know, the guy who's sweeping the floor, why, why, what does it matter if I miss a day sweeping the floor? What shop's going to operate just fine. Well, actually it matters because if we have a customer come in and the floor looks dirty and the shop looks a mess, you know, they're going to think less of us and they're going to think that we do a lower quality job, you know, on and on and on. Um, explaining the why, to your people, I think is for me anyways, is probably the most valuable thing that anybody could have ever done for me. Is that, is that something that you came across in your, um, in, in the consulting that you're doing now and like in your time with like service King and in the shop and everything like that? Um, I would say, you know, when I first started working with my dad, I used to ask the why, um, and he used to just, bluntly tell me, you know, if we don't do this, then a bad repair could happen. And then the customer safety is involved. He made it very basic, but very straight to the point. And he also said, quality is everything. Your integrity is everything. And if you don't have that, then you know, that's a big problem. So what I used to do with technicians, uh, didn't matter if it's a technician or a manager, um, and I would recommend this to anyone in, in any industry, is that if you have two names, you know, the name of your company, and then, you know, your name written on it. I used to always point to the one with the company first. And I used to say, you know, this is where you work but this can change or you could stay there forever but what always will stay with you forever is your name your integrity who you are as a person so even if you don't understand what the whole mission is you have to look at it like if i don't act a certain way if my demeanor is is not where it should be professionally, if I, you know, all these different things, you know, that reputation follows me from job to job, even 
with with family, um, you know, it bleeds in. It, it and so um, that was one thing that I really tried to say to people, and, and it really did work. And I, um, you know, when I was with Service King, I met a young well, when I was at. Uh, Universal Technical Institute. I had a young girl, young woman. She, uh, I got her to be the first apprentice uh, technician in the SoCal market, and mm -hmm. um, I taught them a lot about all of them. They were all young, probably eighteen to twenty, and I taught them about integrity, quality, and showing up on time and stuff of that caliber, and they excelled you know, more uh, than anyone within the whole organization. Um, you know, I just taught a different way of thinking besides how to repair a car. You know, I really tried to go to the nuts and bolts at the beginning stages and, and the rest will lead in to where you want to go as a final product, a final result, management, um, how to get promoted, it, it all starts from the, the beginning roots. And uh, that's kind of uh, with what I, I, I learned with that. So. Hmm. so your time at Service King mm -hmm. ends. And what kind of what kind of happened after that then? Well, then I had the medical. And, yep. um, and then I got invited to Verifax to speak and then I did the uh, consulting with CarStar and then uh, Fender Bender uh, approached me or I approached them and uh, they wrote um, their February uh, article about me and what is interesting about the article is I thought you know originally I, I wanted it to be about my accomplishments what I've done it ended up turning where I was talking about religion and how it got me through what I went through and um, she obviously did talk about you know before everything happened professionally and what happened you know currently professionally but 80% of it was uh, religious base and mm. um, it was number one I think for four months uh, and she said that possibly 41 million people have read the article. And, wow. um, y you know, I, uh, I'm proud of that. You know, it could help someone with the simplest things. It doesn't matter if it's, if whatever kind of, whatever you're dealing with, right? You, you, if you find one thing that'll give you hope, um, in a work work environment, personal, whatever it may be, an ordeal, and you hold on to that and you keep moving forward, uh, you, you know, that's kind of what I learned through all that. But religion was uh, the biggest focal point of that article, and she took a risk, um, and, it, you know, it, it paid off, and, and I think there was a reason um, why uh, it went down that path and I think it helped a lot of people and my first two podcasts uh, I talked about that and it got over six eight hundred views and um, you know the first two podcasts so it had a lot of impact amongst uh, a lot of people and if it touched people you know I had podcasts uh, excuse me that were downloaded now, uh, globally <laughs> from mm -hmm. all the way from Russia to the uh, United Kingdom. Um, and this is all my podcasts combined, but it, it's definitely been uh, a good road with that. For those uh, that would maybe be interested in reading the article, what's the what's the name of it? Uh, just what I would do, because I don't know it. Um, go to FenderBender.com. Just type in my name, uh, C H R I S M A I M O N E, and then at the bottom you'll probably see the article, um, and uh, you'll see all the podcasts, 
and I definitely would recommend uh, you you listen to it. Uh, excuse me, you read it, and I I guarantee you um, you'll find it very enlightening, and uh, it, you might find some w way it might help you in a work environment, uh, personal, professional. Uh, it just opens you up to a different way of thinking. Um, or maybe saying, I don't have it as bad as another individual and it'll just keep you positive going forward. Uh, I I listened to the podcast, The Wow Factor. Um, I forget what the actual name of it is, but it's talking about your ideology of The Wow Factor. Um, would you mind just kind of talking about that briefly for anybody who hasn't or doesn't know what that well, is? Well, the wow factor is the final delivery process uh, that we used at Marcos Auto Body. And um, for people that are in auto collision or the, uh, not listening in auto collision uh, spectrum, you know, every organization from Pizza Hut to... Uh, good restaurant to auto collision to a firm how, how you are at the end of the interaction is what's most important so at marco's we always had uh, a final delivery of a vehicle normally uh, body shops would would just go through the estimate uh, go through just showing them the repairs and then uh, you know saying their goodbyes and 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 probably do a follow phone call and that was about it but at Marco's, we did uh, the show, as we called it. Uh, we had three, at least at San Gabriel, we had three detailers, uh, myself on the delivery. My dad sometimes would, would come by and uh, he always used to check the, um, the battery terminals and he used to always make sure it was tight. Then he would acknowledge the customer. Um, and what we would do is go through all the lights with the customer. We would go through the repairs with the customer. We'd go through the inside of the car, making showing them it was clean, um, showing them uh, the spare tire and toolkit were there, uh, going on test drives on every single car with them. There was reasons behind it that uh, we did all of this. And if you would like to know uh, more, I'd be more than happy to go through it. But at the end of the day, I, we wanted to create customer comfort. We wanted to create uh, where they knew that they were safe in the car. Uh, didn't matter if it was a bumper job or a $10,000 hit. Um, and also too, doing those t the test drives, you can change around uh, a possible customer's point of view, and this again, this exam that that example can go with any kind of work that you do. If you go above and beyond, you, you'll find out. Well, maybe that person had a bad, uh, got fired right before you know they they walked in to your firm, and mm -hmm. the whole interaction they're just moody, and then when they come back, they admit you know. Chris, you know, I was fired when I met you, um, but the experience that I've had with you and how you have been personable with me, um, you know, I'm sorry. And so instead of it being, now you turned it into a positive interaction, a positive, and say, you know, I've had customers saying, I'm gonna be a customer for life. I'll be, you know, be going to your firm for life because of how you treated me even though I was had a certain demeanor about myself or I had that interaction at the beginning and then you showed me that, you know, the, the final result was most important. So, you know, doing those kind of things is important. Just go above and beyond. Uh, we all do it in our individual ways on a personal level. Uh, doing it on a business level, just because your competitor or your your coworker is doing it one way, doesn't mean you don't have to go above and beyond. That's how people get promoted. You know, when they go above and beyond, and that's how they get recognized. So, yeah. What would, what would you say to the guy that's listening? That's listening to this, you know, inspection walkthrough, um, this customer delivery, and is saying. 
that's 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 just a lot of work man like that's that's it's just a lot like you know that's that's really just doing too much and you know the people that i have don't care about that um the customers i have don't care about that kind of stuff because i used to do something kind of similar to that and you know you're going to get people that you know the the general maybe they just genuine generally don't care um at that point in time but there's going to be a couple of people that have had in my experience anyways there's a couple of people that have had a one sort of experience with a shop or maybe a couple of experiences with a couple of different shops and then when they get that experience with you it's like holy cow these guys are these guys are going way above and beyond like this is and what's interesting to me is like you know if you go to an expensive restaurant why do you go to an expensive restaurant it's for it's for the experience like you're paying you're literally paying extra money for Mm -hmm. the experience of it the food you can argue on whether or not it's better you know whatever like a steak is a steak right um but so what would you say to those people that are saying well you know chris you're just you're just doing too much well you hit the nail on the head about the restaurant is that i used to my dad used to always tell me and i used to tell employees that and and customers is that you're never going to six years from now a customer is not going to remember they'll remember the quality but they're not going to remember the accident but what they will remember is how you interacted with them so with the restaurant example that you just gave you're not going to you know if 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 the customer service is on point, you're not going to remember the steak was not to your liking. But if the interaction's bad and the quality's bad, the expectation before they find a problem is here. Once they find a problem, it's here. And eight out of 10 times, you can't please them at that point. So. Yep. It's all damage control well, at that point. Yeah, and you're you might not even be able to repair it. And you gotta remember yep. that an unhappy customer is gonna tell fifteen people, a happy customer maybe tell two. And mm-hmm. one thing I was always told by my dad and by my mom, and I used to tell employees at Service King and you know, when I did cons- when I do consulting, is that we have all the time to do it once right the first time, but people say, well, I'm rushed. I got all these different things I got to do. And then you deliver a, a, a half product. Then the customer finds the problems, the expectations higher. And now you do have time to take care of that car. Why not spend the extra five minutes or 10 minutes or 15 minutes to do it right? Then than spending probably three days of, of your life and, and now you're married to the problem, probably for life at that point. You, and it, gets, it, yeah, it can you, snowball. You had said that you worked in the, the detailing department of the shop or you, know, you worked with the detailing mm-hmm. department of the shop. And what's just what's interesting is kind of what you're doing right now i used to have a similar job in the detailing world which is consulting and you know talking with shops and business owners and everything and my employees that i used to have and these shop owners that i used to talk to i used to ask him you know what's the most important part of the detail and they'd give varying answers and what's interesting is that most of them got it wrong and i said no the windows are actually the the most important part of the detail and they all kind of looked at me and they're like, what? Like, how is that? And I said, the reason why is because the, you could have a mom, you could have anybody, you know, generally I'm making a generalization right now. So please don't attack me in the comments, but women don't typically care too much about um, the outside of a vehicle or, you know, anything like that. Um, and guys care about different things, but it has to be a very specific kind of person to pick up something and paint like the actual paint. So in the body shop world, there's probably not too many people out there that can pick up a bad blend job, right? Like it's just not going to happen. However, everyone, 
everyone can spot a smudge on the glass or streaky glass. And then once they spot that, they start to, oh, well, that's okay. And then they start to look at other things. And then they, and invariably, you, you know, you can't ever do a job to perfection. I mean, you can certainly strive for it, but um, they're going to start finding other things. And then once that whole, th- once that snowball starts, it, it never stops and they're going to be incredibly dissatisfied. So what I always used to tell people is if you don't get the glass correct, you might as well have thrown away the entire detail because they're, they're going to find other things or they're going to be extremely dissatisfied. Um, so what's your, what's your thoughts on, well, on that? Yeah, as you were talking, I thought of that Navy SEAL speech again. And the first concept he brings up, that he talks about making your bed. And yep. he says that, you know, a lot of people are like, you know, we're trying to be warriors, uh, you know, Navy SEALs, but it all started with making your bed and they picked it apart because they, he stated, if you can't make your bed correct, if you can't do the simple things right, you're not going to be able to do the big things right. And so mm-hmm. it all starts from there. And in terms of, you know, a delivery um, or interaction, once they find something, they start witch hunting. And so yep. they're going to see things now that they didn't even see before. Because now that they found one thing, like I said, the expectation was here when they started. Now it's here and you're not going to be able to please them. And no. cutting corners is, is, will cause these things, it'll create habits. Um, you know, if you don't get bit once, maybe you, you cut that corner once or twice or three times and you need to get in trouble. And it starts building, you start building a habit. And then by the fifth time, you do get bit. But you already have that habit ingrained in you. Now you, it's hard to go back to where you once were prior in doing it correctly because now you have that way about yourself. And uh, when you mention the glass, same thing. It's the simplest thing you could do. And, mm-hmm. But that's the one thing people will pick up and then they'll start looking and they'll imagine things half the time but it starts from the beginning it starts first interaction when they pull in the driveway is the shop clean is do they have adequate parking is is the outside look clean does it are the people dressed professionally were they were they do they have the reservation were they um you know greeted properly those start that starts the whole interaction, that whole journey with your body shop, with an organization, yeah. and that will uh, dictate truly how your that experience goes, right at the very beginning. Well, Chris, this has been a, a pretty interesting experience for myself. Um, we're coming up on the end of the hour. Uh, where can people find out more about you? I mean, you said you're going to be at SEMA yes. this year speaking. Um, uh, you're doing consulting mm-hmm. now, correct? Um, so if people want to get a hold of you or see where you're posting or anything like that, where, where uh, can they find you? You can go to you my at? website. It's uh, my first and last name at, dot com. So it's Chris, C-H-R-I-S-M-A-I-M-O-N-E dot com. Or if you look me up on LinkedIn, type in my name. I'm the first one that pops up. You can look me up there. Uh, also, you can go to Fender Bender, uh, type in my name in the search bar, and then you'll see all the podcasts that have currently been released, uh, including the article um, the that was written. Um, but, um, yeah, uh, th- those are the ways that I can be contacted if I can be in any help whatsoever. Uh, you know, please reach out to me and uh, be more than happy to help uh, in any way I can. Uh, It's been a privilege to be speaking today. And I hope that, like I said, if you walked away with one thing, uh, I feel that this this, uh, podcast and this conversation was worth it for you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Chris, for 
spending your time with us today. I really do appreciate it. Glad we uh, worked through some of the technical issues <laughs> from earlier. <laughs> so I hope you have a great yes, rest sir. of the day. Mike. This is the Auto Body Podcast presented by Clarity Code.